this report of God. Undiluted, uncompromised, is bringing it forth, Lord. I pray for my dear pastor. I pray for our church and the things that are set before us, the decisions that are upcoming. I pray for our country, Lord, our dear country, Lord. Only, only you can bring revival. And only you, Lord, can cleanse the big old mess we've made here. Lord, I also pray for Israel today, Lord. And bless the country of Israel. Going through so many, so many attacks, as you said they would. Yes, they Lord always God. have. You've always delivered this. Yes, thank God. Lord, we don't know how many things they say about the big explosion over there. But all, all of us know Satan's behind every bit of it. He wants to destroy your children, bless it. Yeah. Help us, Lord, to preach the truth. Help us, Lord, to stand for you and to be kind and gracious in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Is Asher Moses in the house? Are you busy with him? <laughs> that you hold him up for me? Hold him up. This is my grandson, Asher. And I'm going to dedicate this message to Asher and Simeon. Where's Simeon? I want to mention Simeon too, but not as much as I will Asher. I want to preach today on Asher. And uh, I've enjoyed this message and studying it and throughout the Bible. But we're going to have you turn to the 49th chapter of the book of Genesis. Where Jacob is near death, and he's given his last word testament to his sons, and he had 12. And he spoke to them about their past, he spoke to them about their future. But let's look at uh, Psalm, oh not Psalm, I got my head, it's hard to pull the horse. Uh, Genesis 49 and verse 20. 49, 20. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. So, I like him already. Yeah. He likes fat bread and delicacies, you know, dainties, probably desserts. And so, he's, he's, he's got a pretty good uh, tip there. But Jacob, he was giving out his patriarchal blessing. And the way he put it, no doubt symbolically, that Asher would bread shall be fat, and his uh, and he shall have royal delicacies or dainties. The word Asher means happy. When Leah gave birth to Asher, she, she got so excited, she said, I'm so happy. And so she named Ash, the baby that made her so happy, she named him happy. So happy, happy Asher. So Asher, look at Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 24, 33, 24. This is a very important verse about Asher. And then I tell you there's 47 times in the King James Version the word Asher. Um, 33, 24, Deuteronomy. Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be accepted to his brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. Now, uh, matter of fact, I want to. I didn't turn there. I haven't written down, but I'm going to turn there because I want to read also verse 25. And uh, there shall be iron and brass. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And there is none like unto the God of Jezreel. So we see here Jacob. Uh, gave this blessing, this patriarchal blessing. And um, in Jacob, in his blessing, one of the patriarchs, he gave the blessing individual. But when Moses come back down here and gave the blessing, it was sort of a tribal part and more general. Four things about uh, uh, God said about Asher here in these texts. 
Number one, he said that he would be an abundant tribe with many children. The children of Israel enter into Canaan, the promised land, and the tribe, the tribe of Asher was numbered 53,400 people. So that prophecy was fulfilled, wasn't it? Number two, he said, let him be acceptable to his brethren. Not only was he the abundant tribe, he was the acceptable tribe. It meant Asher was well liked, and uh, he knew how to get along with others. He was a people's person. Now that could be bad, that could be good. Yeah. A lot of people compromise to get along, you know. But he knew how to fit in, you might say. He might have been elected Mr. Con Congeniality uh, with the appeal, appealing nature, character. So he was compatible to get along with people. And uh, uh, when it come to Asher's tribe, God specifically kept them in tribes, and he built the tabernacle, and it was four sides, north, south, east, and west. And he put three tribes on each side of the four sides. And God placed Asher on the north side, right between the two families, the different families. You know, there was a Rachel Leah side, then there was a Bilhah, Zibah, whoever. Uh, uh, wives. So he had four wives. But Asher was placed as the middle tribe because Asher was a peacemaker and he could get along with, with any anybody. Uh, God segregated the tribes by the sides of the tabernacle. And the north side had Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Now Asher was a uh, the acceptable tribe. He was acceptable. So he was the abundant tribe. He was the acceptable tribe. And number three, he was the affluent tribe. He had an abundance of wealth. The Bible speaks something numerously about having oil, olive oil, very expensive, but usually vulnerable to the wealth. Uh, he, uh, he had some, uh, different things. He had iron, brass, and he had uh, uh, food the finest of food. So he must have been a good businessman because he had, he had all these symbols of, of wealth. He had substance. And Deuteronomy 8, 9, he, he uh, uh, had olive, olive oil, fertile crops. He could mine the, still, the uh, grass and the iron. And so he was very wealthy. And the term fat bread that was really good bread, and it, it meant that he ate real good, good, real good. And then you can say that Asher, you, you look at all these things, you say, well, Asher, man, he has it all. He has everything we, we all, all want. He, and and as, as we look at this thing, he had abundance, he had acceptance, he had affluence, and some people said, well, how long could you want any more? But the sad thing is, most people, the more they have, the more they want. And they're always wanting more. There in verse 33, it said, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now, you know what? Some people interpret that to say, Asher, whatever days you, be, you have, you'll always have enough strength to meet them. That sounds good, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that no matter what you do, you'll have strength for your days. You could do bad and not have strength for your days. Because God says what you sow, you're going to reap. But if you trust God, obey God, do right, keep his commandments, you will have strength for tomorrow. So we see that uh, people who live wicked uh, lives, and they will uh, be, God will bring on judgment. Now, God said here about Asher, says, uh, if you live right, keep my commandments, you shall be abundant, accepted, and you shall be employed. But we don't stop there. Uh, number four, he was an alien tribe. He was an alien tribe. Look at Judges chapter one, please. 
Judges chapter 1, and we will look at uh, those verses again. 29, I'll, I'll look at Judges. To mark myself along here. All right, here we go. Judges chapter 1, verse 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites, that's another tribe, that dwelt in Gezer. But Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did uh, Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nathal. But the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Acho and the inhabitants of Zidon and those other names there, but Ash, the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. They did not drive them out. So God said to cast the Canaanites out. Separate yourself from them. Otherwise, if you dwell among them, you'll start wanting to be like them. And they'll end up ruling over you. And that's exactly what happened. So the Canaanites and Ephraim and Asher, those tribes that didn't drive them out, they dwell together. What does God warn us then in the, in the, in the New Testament over there in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6? I'm sure it's very familiar with you, with the fundamental church anyway. They like, they like this portion of scripture. Verse 14, this is what God said. Don't get mad at me. One of the most hated things today in Christianity mm -hmm. is separation. Yeah. Separation from the world. Listen to this. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't marry somebody that's not saved. For what fellowship of righteous with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Baal? And what part hath he that believeth with infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Or are you the temple of the living God? As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and that you be separated. You be separate unto the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters, saith the Lord God. The Bible teaches separation. Your new Bibles, your new versions, and they're trying to do what your modernistic preachers don't want to preach it anymore. Separated living, but that's what the Bible teaches. And you can't please God without living a separated life because it's against his word Amen. and whatever is against his word yep. is against his will. So he warned them, separate from them, drive them out. But they disobeyed. You know, Asher, he didn't want to, he didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want to create waves. He didn't want to get people mad. He didn't get people offended. He didn't want to live and let live. But it ended up destroying his, his family. Uh, in the first Judges 1 verse 29, it dwelt among the Ephraimites, verse 30, dwelt among the Canaanites, verse 31, did not drive out the seven cities there. Number 32, Asher uh, continually to dwell among the Canaanites, and they did not drive them out. So we're calling them now the ailing and failing tribe. Yeah. They, they never conquered anybody, Asher. No record of Asher conquering anybody. They never drove anybody from the land like God said to do. They just said, obey God. And when Israel failed to separate the wicked from false worshipers, and the people began to rule over the children of Israel, and they enslaved them. Now, when you uh, search out Asher in the Old Testament, you won't find one prince. You won't find one judge. You won't find one prophet from the tribe of Asher. They just went along to get along. Status quo. Ho hum. Live and let live. Uh, don't make any waves, as that preacher here 
And Rothwell said, but God said, drive them out, lest you forsake God yeah. and become like them. That's what God said would happen, and it happened. So you, when you lay down with the dogs, the old preacher said, you're going to get up with his fleas. Now, Asher was an alien tribe who had everything we think we need, we think we want, but yet he failed to serve God. Now, Judges chapter 1, 32, 31, uh, all, they didn't separate from those people. They were Satan worshipers. They were pagan infidels, false gods and deities and idols, and immorality and perversion was wide open. And God said, drive them out. He said, don't even let, leave the pictures hanging on the wall that could corrupt your mind. I wonder how that compares with television nowadays, if they couldn't have a still picture on the wall. Right. But anyway, he dwelt among them. Some think they, some, some think this way. Well, if I had an abundant life, if I was accepted by everybody, and I was affluent and wealthy, I could really do something for God. No, friend, if you don't serve God with little, you're not going to serve Amen. with much. So Asher had it all that people think they want, but he, he failed. Now, if we ended right there, it'd be a sad story, but we don't end there. We're going to find something that, you know, who was that that said, now the rest of the story. The story doesn't end there. Though if you run your references in the Bible, you say, well, that's in all the Old Testament. I don't find any. Oh, wait a minute. That's not where the story, the story ends. The story ends in the New Testament. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we need to see the rest of the story. In Luke chapter 2, uh, Jesus was born, and as a new baby, 12 days old, he was brought to the temple by Joseph and Mary to be consecrated and dedicated, circumcised, sanctified, according to the law they gave the forest uh, uh, sacrifice allowable by law to turtle dove. So they were very, very poor and qualified for that. And chapter 2, verse 22, they're in the process of presenting Jesus to the Lord. And brother, when they did that, look what happens. Verse 25, I want to read this because I want to come back later in the end of the message. So we see here in, uh, excuse me, lay it around here again, a Luke Chapter 2, let's look at this here, and verse, let's start up with 25. Behold, there was in Jerusalem a man whose name was Simeon, and that same man was just and devout and waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Amen. That's my kind of Baptist. And it was revealed that by him, by the Holy Ghost, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. What's amazing about that? Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, tabulated from records he found that Simeon was 112 years old. So he had that promise. And so uh, he should not see death before he sees the Lord's Christ. That's Messiah. And it came by the Spirit, and he came by the Spirit, Spirit led into the temple. I like that Spirit led worship. And when the parents, Joseph and Mary, brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, what did he do? He went right up. And he took him up in his arms, what a blessing, and he blessed God, and he said, he's prophesying now, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, 
for mine eyes have seen thy salvation in which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and Mary, with his mother, marveled at these things which were spoken. And Simon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is sent for fallen rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken unto thee. Yet a sword shall pierce through thine own soul, that and thy thoughts may be uh, men, uh, thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So we see that one of blessing of this great man, this elder, this faithful man of God, whose name was Simeon. Now there's something happens here that I don't want you to miss. We find a hero. Look at verse chapter chapter one, verse thirty or two thirty three. It's thirty four six. And there was one Anna, a prophetess a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, which is a New Testament way of putting Asher, same word, same word, it's Asher. She was of the tribe of Asher. So her name might have been Anna Asher. <laughs> and she was of great age and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Praise God, she was a virgin. When she got married, amen. And she was a widow about four score, that's 80 and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she was coming in the the and she she was coming in at the instant and gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all uh, uh, that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Paul, is this a divine encounter or what? Is this God's precise timing? He brought, brings them all together at the same place, at the same time. And we have here a wonderful, wonderful story. She was a hero, and what a hero she was. Let me show you some things here. In the Old Testament, I, remember, I said that Asher had no prince, no prophet, no priest, no, no judge, and uh, they had no outstanding last word. Uh, they had no special uh, commemoration or anything like that. And they compromised with the people, dwelt among them, and refused to obey God and drive them out of the land. And 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Come out from among them, be ye separate, says the Lord. That's not the unclean thing. Jesus is the perfect example of separation. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 2, 26, and such a high priest became him who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, and made higher than the heaven. Jesus taught, believed, and practiced separation. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5, 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Nowadays, Satan's not smart. Nowadays, Satan has a Trojan horse to get in our home and cause our children to want to be like the world and depart uh, from God. And that Trojan horse may be the television set. It may be uh, internet, maybe cell phones, maybe a computer. Maybe uh, video games that are unprotected. And those have the potential of satanic poison being put into the minds and hearts of children. If you don't believe what I'm saying is true, look at these demonstrations in the streets of America. Where did they, what happened to those people? What happened to their up training? They're bringing up. But instead of driving them out, and separating from them, we don't want to be separated. Most people today want to be popular, want to be pleasing. 
want to have big crowds at church and so forth without offending people. So they trim their message and they compromise, tickle people's ears. And instead of driving them out, we've invited them right in our home. We put them right in the center of the living room and to teach our children. And no, no wonder t TV addicts, uh, cell phone addicts, video game addicts, they come to church and then you hear me, I'm sure bored. Well, look what we're competing with. See, that all appeals to the flesh. It energizes the flesh. And you try to come in here and teach people spiritually, they're so full of the flesh and the yeah. world Amen. and the devil, they don't have an appetite for God. Amen. They don't want God. So that's what we find. But, but here we find this woman, Asherite, man, she loved God and she... Uh, and God did not forget Asher. You know, God remembered him all these centuries. And God had his eye on that old woman. That 84-year-old senior citizen. And God had been watching her for all these years. And uh, you know what? God's watching you too. Amen. And God keeps a record. And so far, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. There's some words there in 236 I want you to see, and I want you to underline. And there was one. I've never seen that in all my studies till this time. And there was one. Isn't that interesting how God introduced Anna? And there was one, and I'm sure he's comparing her with maybe all the other tribes of Asher. But there was one. A lot of people say, there's no heroes in my family. Well, then why don't you be one? Amen. Some people say there's nobody standing for God at work. Well, then why don't you stand for God at work? But there's no one in my family really has a genuine Christian life. Then how about you having, having one? Amen. That there's, there's a, no hero or Heroes, where you go to school, how about you being one? Praise God for Anna. She was a woman of God, and there was one. You see, God begins talking about Anna. Then there was one. That's divine inspiration. God takes a divine pause there, and he's telling these things that's happened, and all of us, and conjunction. There was one. Well, that one was on God's heart Amen. and on God's mind. And he said, uh, and there was, there, there was one. She was one of the tribe of Asher. She's the only one that took a stand. Uh, and then you say, well, nobody else has taken a stand. Everybody else is not doing it. Well, you take a stand. You want your God to say, there was one. But there was one. One lives, uh, look, look at her, One, she left, lived her life separate from the world. Why don't you do that? Why don't you be one that keeps the Bible dress codes and standards and be, be modest and be godly? Why don't you be the one? Say, well, nobody else is like that anymore. Well, why don't you be the one? See, that's a contrast with everybody else. But there was one. But there was one. So, well, you might as well. Give up that fight and that battle, preacher, of separation. It's long lost. And then I read this and see, Anna says, don't you do it. Stay true to your convictions. Stay true to the Bible and the word of God. He said, well, nobody else is so witty and witnessing faithfully. Well, why don't you be the one that does it? Why don't you be the one? Don't wait on anybody else. What about being faithful to the house of God? People, some people miss church so easy, and uh, they got they have to blow their nose. They miss church. But why don't you be the one that, through sunshine and rain and through the storm and sickness and sorrow, why don't you stay faithful? I'm here. I'm here for you, you God, and uh, serve God by the grace of God. By the grace of God, serve God. Be faithful to Him, no matter what what happens. 
and be a hero for God. And there was one. Let me hurry. Anna was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Asher. You say, how in the world can you say that, Brother Isaac? I'll tell you. It said here, let Asher uh, be blessed with children. Okay, I got you there. She was a widow. And she never had any children. But wait a minute. God gave her a child. Mm -hmm. And that child was worth more than all the children of the world put together. And she came in and God, God gave her the Messiah's a child, Jesus. And he was a blessing unto her and made it worth it all for her. She named his name and said, my Redeemer liveth. And then look at Luke 2.25. We see that Simon was spirit-filled, elder, but he wasn't too old to serve God. And Anna wasn't too old to serve God. And nobody's too old to serve God. Amen. If you're breathing breath, serve God. If all you can do is grow, uh, grow for God. <laughs> Amen. He was indwelled. Uh, he said, but anyway, Joseph uh, was led by, led by the Spirit to Simeon. Simeon brought them together, brought them together. Same week, same day, same hour. So you see, God's in control. God's watching over you. You might think, who's caring about those little details? God is. He's big enough, God, to do, do that. You say, well, she's, a, she's not really different. She's not really different because she's uh, uh, not acceptable. Well, the Bible says that she talked to everybody about the Redeemer. She spoke to every, everybody. She blessed and praised God the Savior. And then you say, well, she wasn't affluent, that's for sure. Oh, yes, she was. She had spiritual riches laid up in a multi-billionaire in heaven or more. She's called a prophetess. She said, uh oh, here we go, charismatic preacher woman. No, the word prophet means inspired teacher. Right. The Bible said to teach women and so forth. But it was, uh, there's only two times of the words in the Bible and in the New Testament. And one of them is negative, just the only time. It's used prophet, uh, positive. She, she was, she used, she taught for God. That means she knew the word of God backwards and forth. She knew the prophecies, she knew the promises, and she was a witness for God. She entered the temple, she was only 21 years old. And she went on and served God 84 years till she was 105 years old. She didn't use her age as an excuse. And all the time you see, what was she doing? What was the main thing she was living for? To see Jesus. Yeah. To see Jesus. What are you living for? And also, Asher was acceptable to the brother, verse 38. They talked about the Lord already said that. How did she differ from, from Asher? Here's the best way. She wasn't an ailing failure like, like her forefather. She wasn't ailing. Moses spoke of Asher, said, As your days, so shall your strength be. She got married lived seven years with a husband. He died, and then she entered the temple and never stopped. She kept going every day, fasting and praying and serving. They probably gave her something to do, and she served God night and day. That's how their days begin. And uh, until she sees Jesus, until Jesus came. And she, the Bible says, she departed not from the temple. Now I've heard arguments that she wouldn't be living in the temple. She'd have to go there every day. I don't know. They had living quarters for uh, somebody like that. I just don't know. Uh, but uh, that's no big deal. The fact is she was there. Whether she got a head start by living somewhere on the grounds or if she uh, lived nearby. But she went there every day, night and day. She didn't, if she, and so forth. She, the fact of the testimony here, she never failed to go to the house of God. Though she was 105 years old, she did not let that keep her 
from the house of God. What's your excuse to miss church? Well, I'm a fair weather Christian. I'll just go when the weather's neither too bad or too good. Too good, I want to go out there and picnic, but if it's too bad, then I, I guess I just like it in the, I don't want to go. So it's got to be in the fair weather Christian. Some people say, I, 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 I just don't feel like going. They, don't, they come when they feel like it. And then uh, one person said, I got a bad toe. A bad toe. Here's my favorite. In Kentucky, we had a revival. Going around inviting people during the day to come to revival at night. I even forget who this evangelist was that was with me. But we went to this woman and she said, oh, I can't come to church. And we said, well, why can't you come to church? She said, because of those pews. And I have an inflatable donut I have to sit on. And my donut is flat. And that preacher said, bless God, honey, we'll patch that donut so you can come to the house of God. <laughs> Flat donut. <laughs> I'm sure God wrote that down in, in, in the, one day. Flat donut. Some people come when it's convenient, when they're not too tired, uh, or the company's not coming by today, or, uh, oh, I'll just watch it on television. I'll substitute it. And we're not talking about Zoom right now with the church because that's the circumstances uh, we're at to deal with. But we ought to be ashamed to miss church. It's the body, the bride of Christ. As you treat the church, you treat Christ. I heard a fantastic preacher the other day, and he preached a whole discourse on the end of time, and he didn't mention the church one time. There's something wrong with that theology. Thank you, you're welcome. A woman 105 years old, can you imagine? Imagine she probably had poor eyesight, didn't have modern convenience and optometrist and all that back then. She probably had a hearing deficit. She probably had arthritis and bursitis. <coughs> All the other side of the family, and she probably heard it like the fellow said, if it don't hurt, it don't work. And she was 105 years old. Her joints was hurting. Her sight was, the ear hearing is almost gone. Her bones were stiff and old. She was feeble, and she had probably outlived most people that she knew. That was really old in those days. 105 is old in our day. But it was much more then when people were averaging dying about 45. But anyway, she went, uh, uh, and she, she was serious. She loved God. She wanted to serve God. The Bible says, and there was one. Praise God, she was the one sold out for God. She kept nothing to keep her from being what God wanted her to be. She was not a part-time Christian. She was a full-time Christian. And God knew all about her, as I said, he knows about you. And if I, one person said, well, if I take my kids all the time to church, they'll get burnt out. Well, I'd rather them get burnt out than rust out and rot out. Most of them out there now, rotten out. Amen. Mm -hmm. They're rotten. Those kids in the street that we're seeing in television, they're rotten to the core. She made up her mind that there was nothing or no one more important to her than serving God. And she fasted and she prayed and that's real genuine stuff there. So Anna Asher loved the Lord and she wasn't ailing. 105 years old, still faithful to God, day and night, fasting, praying, and serving. She wasn't living for the world. And uh, like Moses, she looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. She was a hero, and Asher's tribe finally made the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it was a the time she lived wasn't easy, and Israel was a slave nation, no welfare, no widow pensions, no senior a citizen home, no food stand, but hardship, difficulty, uh, from, from and serving God. Four things to find about Anna. And uh, nobody 
Um, anyway, she served God in difficult, dark days. Difficult, dark days, like us today. John the Baptist was a preacher in her day, and he uh, preached against, against sin, and he preached without fear or compromise, and he told those religious hypocrites, who's warned you to flee from the wrath of God, and he called for repentance of sin, and he preached, and he preached that against, he preached against counterfeits. He preached against, uh, I don't remove that. He preached against counterfeit religion. He preached against adultery. Got his head cut off. Political leaders were wicked in his day like ours, or her day. Corrupt like Herod who said, uh, who, who, who sought to have Jesus murdered as a baby. Politics was rotten to the core, just like our day, blind leaders of the vine. People think that they had it bad to serve God. It's too bad to serve God, too hard to serve God. I've had preachers tell me that and quit the ministry. That's just too hard. It's too hard. How can they follow Jesus and say it's too hard? How can they look at the cross and say it's too hard? Listen. We have empty pews and dropout Christians. No repentance being preached and it's paving the way straight to hell. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, religion without Christ will send you to hell. Wicked leaders didn't stop Anna Asher from serving God. John the Baptist came uh, to, to the, the many, to, to, John the Baptist said, he came that many might be saved. Well, that means there was many not saved. So there was apostasy. Anna lived in a time when the majority was lost, wicked, unsaved. Anna didn't let a popular public opinion stop her from serving God. She served God in dark days and difficult times. She served God during times of deep sorrow. After seven years, she lost her mate. He dies and leaves her alone. And the next 84 years, she's serving in the temple. She lost her maid while she was very young, just 21 years old. And it, she was had lonely and long nights and the sorrow of losing a loved one. And she could have blamed God. She could have quit and got bitter and depressed and unhappy. But no, she praised God. She served God. She loved God. Jesus said, 11, 28, Matthew, come unto me, all you labor. Heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said in us, 1 Peter 3 5, cast all you care upon me, for I care for you. He said in Hebrews 13 5, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So don't let your hurts stop you from serving God. Sandra and I have had more hurt this year than any time in our whole life. But we're not going to ser stop serving God. Yeah. We're going to keep on keeping on for the glory of God. And people can slander me and try to destroy me and my ministry and my home if they want to. But I know God knows the truth. And God knows what that we love. And he knows we love you. So we need to speak true to him. And she had a life of pain and suffering, but she didn't speak of that. She didn't speak of herself. She, she spoke of God. She wasn't a whining, complaining Christian. She was full of praise and prayer and fasting. She lived during a time of dark settings, deep sorrows, and lastly, she gave herself to daily service. She served God with prayers and fastings night and day. That means she never gave up. She never quit. She never quit. Now, you know what's different between her and Simeon? Simeon was filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say that about Adam, though I believe she was. As the Holy Ghost revealed to him that he wouldn't see death until he had seen the Lord Christ. Well, we don't find that in, in Anna's testimony either. And that the Holy Ghost led him to the temple that day. And it doesn't say that he led her to the temple. You know why? She's already there. She was already there. And so we see that Anna Asher, she was faithful to God, and she happened to sound, she was a voice of someone.
that loved God and was still looking for the Messiah. And she probably had a battle. It wasn't easy to go to the temple. She probably didn't feel like it. It probably hurt. She was weak and ill and feeble. But you know what? She was glad that she could come to the house of God. And she kept on year after year after year. She kept on keeping on. She was faithful. She was faithful to God, faithful to pray, faithful in the word of God. And uh, I think that I want to challenge you today. Show your family that you love God. Show the devil you love him. Show the world you, whose side you're on. Show whose side you're on. The old man went blind and deaf and still came to church and said, and somehow they communicated with him and said, why do you come? He said, I want, I want everybody to know whose side I'm on. And so he couldn't see good enough to see or hear good enough to hear, but he was going to be counted on God's side. Now, Anna served God despite the circumstances. She kept on keeping on. And then number four, she got to see the delightful one. The delightful one. She got to see the one she'd been looking for for 84 years. I'd love to be there. I hope there's a video playback of that day when we get to when we get to heaven. She knew the prophecies. She knew the promises of God's inspired word. And she was called a prophetess to speak and witness. You know why she knew the Bible? I believe she knew. And then, that, and then she was where they studied the Bible. And they said calls of learning. And she could hear them quoting the Torah and so forth and the scholars. And though she may not have been permitted in, inside the inner circle with them, she could stand outside and the women uh, could overhear what, what had been taught and what had been said. I was, uh, I was looking at a, uh, a song that I thought Charles Weigel wrote. You know, he wrote... Um, Now that famous song, Charles White. Uh, can't believe that. But anyway, I thought he wrote the song When We See Christ. But it was a woman but named uh, Esther Kier Rothoff. And 1941, she wrote it. And she was going through one tragedy after another. Her life was filled with sorrow. Her church had a big scandal that never broke her heart to pieces. And she died at the very young age of uh, 53. She died 53 years old. But she wrote this song and it immediately went around the world. All times the day seems long, our trials are to bear, but we're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair, but Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over on God's eternal day. It, sing for with me. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Come on. One glance of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on 
no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem. Let's go to him in prayer. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Oh, on the lips of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. But there is when life's day will soon be o'er. All storms forever past will cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a heart, a whole crowd. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. Say, it will be worth it all. So small when we see Christ on the lips of his new face, all sorrows will be raised. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear Pastor.